Well, he says, I'm not convicted yet, so um, this, this drunk driving charge against me, is my new employer going to pick it up from my abstract? I said, no, it never hits your abstract until and unless you're convicted. He said, but after I'm convicted, will they take it off? No, because it was never there in the first place. There's nothing to take off. At that initial interview, you need to look at that factor of, is this a client that I'm going to want to spend the next two years with and invest in, particularly in a case with catastrophic injuries, and invest in with and try the case. But where it touches upon a motor vehicle accident case is when we're talking about crashworthiness. Mm -hmm. And that crashworthiness is a term that has a body of case law that follows it. Essentially what we're talking about is if you're in an accident, you're rear-ended, you may have injuries that are directly attributable to being rear-ended in a moderate speed accident. The prosecution's argument was that in this particular case, uh, the defendant had the right to counsel. Uh, maybe he waived the right to counsel. And under those circumstances, there's no issue about a step down. This is a person who spoke to an attorney. As public defender, when I go through with the defendant, I'll say, look, you understand if the judge accepts your plea of guilty, you're subject to a range of punishment. You're going to get a fine of between $250 and uh, $400. The judge is going to suspend your driver's license for 90 days. Do you understand that? He's going to order you to go to the Intoxicated Driver Resource Center. Do you understand that? You're, you could go to jail for up to 30 days. Do you understand that? No, let's go through every aspect of the sentence and get an affirmative indication from the defendant that he knows that this is part of the deal he's getting himself into. That's the one we see on TV, and that's when the cop yells, you're under arrest. Well, 99% of the time, a person's under arrest without being told he's under arrest when a reasonable person, and correct me if my language is incorrect, but when a reasonable person believes he's no longer free to leave, that's when he's under arrest. When the municipality takes it upon themselves to go out and uh, go the extra step, you know, they're going to start to get some convictions on these types of cases, uh, as opposed to what Steve points out, that, uh, you know, it's just basically they don't quantify that and I take it Ocean County doesn't use uh, state police lab. We don't. We use a private lab for everything. Let me just clarify that though. You know for your purposes we're talking about DWI convictions. For my purposes we're talking about certainly establishing a DWI which is not the same necessarily as establishing a reckless. Even a case like Washington which talks about weaving uh, within the lane and nine miles below the speed limit. There were some other factors in there. You could have very similar facts to Martinez and the stop may still get thrown out. The key as a police officer is simply to document what you saw as accurately and completely as possible. A special word to police officers here on this. The best motion to suppress evidence is the one that doesn't get filed, okay? I guess as a quasi-expert, if you read State versus Beale, at least with respect to marijuana cases, and make the jump from whether or not the person was under the influence from what was found at the scene based on what they observed. Bob Pinizzato, this was in your jurisdiction. Were you involved in this case at all? No, I wasn't. Um, Beeler has been very, very good to me. And what I mean by that is, when you look at Beeler and DiCarlo, um, I believe that any municipal prosecutor worth their weight is going to be able to get a conviction. Woodruff tells you what other states have decided and gives you some good rules to follow in terms of determining whether that constitutes probable cause for a stop. It does say that merely going out of your lane where you don't affect other traffic, where there's no other traffic around, it's not perfect driving, that's probably not reason for a stop. That's not probable cause, and that's not really what the statute proscribes or forbids. And you'll see how the trooper, as the record unfolds in this case, develops one piece after another piece after another piece. The fact of the matter is that even if this was not a highly regulated area, he builds his case for probable cause even though he doesn't need it. And so in that sense, I think it's very instructive for every police officer in this, in this room. Now this is the key thing for judges to know. Kind of circle this and think about this if you're going to consider a 110-1 proceeding. The power of our courts to punish for contempt is long established. It goes back a thousand years. We have described it as an extraordinary power to be exercised sparingly. But I think the best thing to do if you can avoid and try to stay true to the Supreme Court's directive to use this power sparingly and in the rarest of circumstances, if you have somebody like they just eject it from the courtroom and have them come back at the end of the session when everybody's gone and you can deal with it in a, um, in a little bit better way. In other words, you'll have a chance to cool down, the defendant can cool down, or if he's going to make a big scene, his audience will be gone and sometimes that's enough. But you've got to remember also, Lots of times you can't do that. You have somebody who's just a really 
tried to publicly embarrass you in front of a courtroom full of people, that's something that requires immediate action in order for you to maintain your authority. I said, I'm not allowed to see the police report he wrote in this case? Not if he doesn't use it to refresh his recollection. You're not allowed to see his police report. What about the discovery request they made? But if he doesn't use it to refresh his recollection, you're not allowed to see it. So I was frustrated, and I remember I reacted, and since it was such a juvenile uh, ruling, I felt, I simply sat down and counseled him and said, fine, I'm not participating in the trial. You try it without me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. And do you know something? He says, OK, fine, you can look at it. <laughs> the truth. The next witness qualification is the ability of the witness to relate his testimony in a meaningful way. And the court ruled no, that even though Virginia requires a citation in lieu of arrest, it does not suppress it under the Fourth Amendment. It wasn't a triggering mechanism, a definitive A, B, or C event. It was a, well, if it sounds like A, if it smells like B, or it looks like C, then you can do the warrant. That was the distinction between what we know as an anticipatory warrant and this particular warrant, which was disallowed. They didn't prove that it happened in Mount Laura. In fact, the evidence in the case is what happened in Camden. So within 20 days, you'd ask the judge to go back in and reconsider his decision based on the fact that the state did not satisfy that element of the offense, you know, as to jurisdiction. And actually, the court didn't have any jurisdiction to, um, to try the case in the first place. If the judge agrees with you, that would be something that would be ripe for dismissal, again, citing Rule 7, 8-5.